Hi, everybody. It's me, Language Bay. You're now rocking with the best. Um, I'm here today with Danielle. Today, we're going to talk about her language journey and basically share some tips with, that helped her with you all that might help you. So thank you, Danielle. How are you doing? I'm so well. How are you? Thanks so much for inviting me to be your guest on your show. Appreciate it. Yeah, no, I'm just excited. I know that you have mentioned it a, a while ago before I went on hiatus. You said you were interested. So it's good that you're still interested and I'm able to get you on the show. So I'm really excited. Thank you. Thanks so much. I'm excited too. A little nervous, but I'm really excited too. No, don't be nervous. It's really <laughs> just conversation between you and I. And, you know, until now, I haven't seen any mean comments on YouTube when I upload. That's, that's reassuring. No, don't worry. It's fine. Everybody who comes, they want to see it. So, mm -hmm. um, so yeah. So tell us about yourself. Uh, you know, your name's Danielle. Where are you located? And, you know, what's your native language? What's the languages that you're, are your target languages? Uh, so I'm based in Seattle right now, um, born and raised in Detroit. Uh, I'm a freelance writer here. Um, I grew up in a monolingual household, uh, just, just English. And um, my target languages are, um, Fr well, French and Italian are the languages that I speak well. And then I'm learning, I've been, I started learning Russian last year. And I've studied a little bit of Spanish and um, American Sign Language, but those are not, I'm not strong in, uh, in those languages. Okay, well, that's interesting. So then um, also, before we get to your languages, uh, what do you do professionally? Uh, do you have anything, any kind of side hustle that you do in addition to what you do professionally? And like, kind of tell us your academic background, like what you have your degrees in. So I, uh, I'm a freelance writer, and um, my uh, bachelor's degree is was in English language and literature, and then I, I got a master's degree in education with a focus on language and literacy. Um, and uh, in addition to writing, I've, I've kind of been doing a little photography on the side, but mostly as a, as a hobbyist, certainly not... Um, at least not at this point on, a, on an entrepreneurial level, but just, yeah, just kind of for fun. Okay, and so as a freelancer, are you dedicated to one platform or do you work for different media outlets or, or do you, like, what did, do you do? Do you write articles, books, what do you do? So um, mostly articles, um, that's kind of what pays the bills uh, and or expands my uh, portfolio, but I am, uh, working on a, an essay collection right now, and I also write uh, some some essays as well, like personal essays. Okay, cool. Yeah. And then also your academic background. You said you had a um, wait. You said you had a bachelor's in English literature and culture. Uh, English language and literature. Okay, English language mm -hmm. and literature, and then the master's and education. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, have you thought about teaching English, or have you done that already? Yes, I, um, so I, sometimes I joke that I'm a recovering teacher. I don't teach anymore. I used to teach um, English as well as French, um, which I'm, I know we'll get to when we talk more about um, language experiences, but, and I was also, um, I also taught algebra for a time. So um, that was um, about 10, well, over 10 years ago when I started teaching and then I, I wasn't in the profession for very long. Um, I had the Another thing that I say often is that I had the heart for it, but not the stomach. So I was um, not very good at um, classroom management. Other other skills, you know, I was strong with. Like I have, I'm re I'm good with kids in other ways, and also relaying the content. Like that wasn't an issue. But just like, um, in fact, one student said, "You know, you're too nice. That's why they act up." <laughs> so I, yeah, that was my biggest struggle. So I I didn't stay in teaching that long. But I still like volunteer with kids, but I don't, I'm not in the classroom anymore. Let me just take the opportunity to say, you don't look like you've been working nowhere for no 10 years. <laughs> oh, Hashtag be, Black <laughs> Don't Crack. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'll, be, I'll be 34 this year in a couple months. So in a few no, months. I would have guessed 10 years younger, no way. Oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> I get that a lot. Thank you, I appreciate that. No problem, no problem. Mm -hmm. So. 
Okay, well, that's good. So did, when you taught English, did you teach it like as a language arts or did you teach it like English as a foreign language? Oh, uh, language arts. Okay, and so would you, would you say, okay, so now we're gonna do a shift. So basically, um, as far as your languages go, so what, what made you decide to pursue each language that you have pursued to the varying degrees? Um, so with French, I attended a foreign language immersion school and my choices were French, Spanish and uh, Japanese at the time. Later on, they had a Chinese program, but at the time it, it was those three. And um, even even at age five, like I knew Japanese just seemed really hard. I was afraid, you know, it was really daunting. And then uh, Spanish, my brother had taken a little bit of Spanish. So I wanted to be different than my older brother. So I was like, well, I'll just do French. And then I really fell in love with the language. Um, but K through, you know, so again, it was immersion school. So we weren't just learning, you know, two times two. It was like the fois de, like, so everything was in. So um, yeah, everything was in French. So I got really strong in that. And then with Italian, I started that not till I was like in my 20s, like I took a really intensive language class as one of my electives in graduate school. And then after um, after grad school is when I moved to Seattle and I, I kept taking it um, in Seattle. Um, and then with Spanish, it was more of a pragmatic approach. It was like, okay, this will be useful. Um, so I just took like a class at a local community college just to get kind of the, the basics. But, you know, again, I don't have a strong command of Spanish. And then um, with American Sign Language, again, that was also in grad school. There was just a girl I knew who was fluent in it. And she said, hey, d does anybody want to get together every Friday and I'll teach you guys some sign language? And we were like, yeah, um, why not, you know? So um, we would meet every Friday. And then um, with Russian, I just uh, loved the way it, it sounded. And um, I just started, I've been meaning to do it for years. And finally last year, I was like, okay, I'm gonna do this Russian thing, so yeah. Wow, okay, and then also, <laughs> Getting back to something you alluded to before, you said you had got the opportunity to teach some French? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so my very first teaching job uh, was in 2011. Uh, that was in Detroit. And I, I initially wanted to be an English teacher. You know, that was like my whole trajectory. I was gonna be this, this bomb English teacher, life-changing, you know, all that stuff. But um, yeah, okay. the, <laughs> the openings, yeah, they're, they're, uh, the the teaching profession is really saturated with, with English teachers, at least it was at the time, and at least in, in Detroit. So they were like, well, we don't really need English teachers. Do you speak any other languages? And I was like, yeah, no French. So um, I got hired as a, as a French teacher. That was like overwhelming, not just because of my temperament and like I'm, me being too soft, but also um, it was a K through eight school. So I, I was teaching all grade level, not every day, but like, for example, I'll have kindergarten, um, Monday and Tuesday in the first grade, I'll have Monday and Wednesday. And then every, you know, um, it was just like, I had just the sheer number of like lessons and planning and just it being my first year, that was just a lot. And then I taught, uh, when I moved to Washington State, um, I started teaching at a smaller um, alternative school. So I had fewer students. So that was a lot easier. And uh, um, again, I was teaching, that's when I was teaching three subjects, so French, um, English, and then they were like, are you good at other subjects? I was like, oh, I'm good at math, so I was teaching math too, so it was a, that was a lot, but it was better than the first position, so, but then after that, I left in 2014, that's when I stopped teaching. Okay, mm -hmm. and so would you say, which one did you enjoy mo most, teaching French or teaching English? Actually, I liked teaching math because <laughs> I really do like that. I mean, I'm most passionate about about uh, language, but as far as the teaching itself, math, it was just fun. And there are right or wrong, 
you know, there's this way to do it with, with English. There's so much nuance and it's, uh, it's difficult. It's, it's not as easy to teach someone how to write well. Um, and like, or if we were talking about, um, you know, the text or something like different interpretation. I don't know. Math was just a lot, a lot, uh, a lot more um, straightforward. But if I had to choose between English and French, I would say it was more fun to, to teach French because um, I don't know. It's just like I just felt really proud, I guess. And I, you know, I don't say that to be boastful or anything, but it was just like this is so cool. Like I get to teach a foreign language um, to somebody else and open up a new world and introduce idioms and uh, just different different ways of communication, different ways of, of thinking, cultural lessons that are introduced with new languages. So that was cool. Yeah. Okay. And then did you find yourself, well, I would imagine when you studied English, you studied it, you, you, you drilled down to the, to basically to, to basically the atom on that so like you gotten to to study English at different uh phases like old English middle English mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um and then even down to prefixes suffixes root root words and all that stuff would you say that studying I mean do you feel like it was like studying another language like when you got to that level I mean oh yeah certain some of the yeah some of the texts we read I um I, I took a class my senior year uh called what was it sex and religion and early English drama and a lot of the plays we read yeah were were in old English and it was almost you know it's very um I mean English is a Germanic language anyway but of course the old English it was some of it was like hard to you know, it was very dense and like hard to hard to get through. And then like you were saying about the root words and like um, just exploring like etymology, um, which is a labyrinth in itself, but like really also fascinating. And because then you have the, the Greek and the Latin. And so I was like kind of exploring those things too. Um, so yeah, it was like, it was really cool to get, like really dive deep into, 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 um, English like so so everything about my life pretty much has been about language either a foreign language or or my native tongue so yeah okay and then so now this may I just have a random question just kind of popped in my head so if you could wake up tomorrow fluent in two languages in addition to your English and not just fluent like native level fluency mm -hmm. if you could wake up tomorrow and have two additional native level fluency languages which ones would they be and why oh man uh Italian has to be has to be one of them because I just love the way that it sounds like even even things that are you know that don't have pretty meanings are beautiful, like vergognati means shame on you, or like il gabinetto degli uomini is like the men's bathroom. <laughs> so no matter what you're saying, it's like, oh, it sounds so pretty. And then the second language, um, I'm torn between French and Russian. I, I would say Russian because uh, I'm not necessarily proud of this answer, but if I could be automatically fluent, I could bypass all of the um, arduous, like, grammar and stuff that I've <laughs> that I've been dealing with with Russia is definitely the most the the most difficult language that I've studied so um yeah so French so sorry Italian and Russian too so both of us I mean I don't blame you like if it was up to me I would choose like Arabic and Japanese because mm -hmm. obviously you can just bypass because it takes <laughs> such a long time like it's yes. not like learning Spanish learning French um, learning Dutch. It's not like that. It's like a whole nother alphabet. We're in Japanese, three different <laughs> alphabets. Um, it's, it's, you know, so I would, if I'm going, I'm just saying my, my thing, thinking in a, like, like a pragmatic way. If, if I'm going to use my two wishes, I'm going to use it on the hardest. <laughs> <laughs> so I totally understand that one. Mm -hmm. um, so then what would you say in addition to f teaching French, getting the opportunity to teach French, were there any other 
accomplishments or any other things that you were able to accomplish because of your exposure to languages? Um, yes, um, let's see, when I was younger, um, my family and I had the opportunity to host an exchange student for a summer. Um, I was 11 at the time and she was 14, she was from Mali. Um, and so we communicated exclusively in French. Um, and obviously there were some things that, that I didn't know um, how to say, but I, we knew, I knew enough to, we had a, we had a great time um, and we became friends and we were right to each other for a little while after that. So um, that's one opportunity. And then um, let's see in 2018, um, so let me back up a bit. So Seattle's sister city in Italy is Perugia. So there's a local, um, Seattle Perugia Sister City Association, and they every year, ex at least pre-pandemic, they offered a scholarship um, for four people to study in Perugia for a month um, and take classes every day. So you would get a, a um, your tuition was paid, and then you got a small stipend to help with living expenses or airfare or whatever. And I applied for that scholarship. So in 2018, I got to go to Italy for um, four weeks and study there and so that was amazing and um not only did i get to take classes and learn more italian but i got to you know travel like on the weekends there was no class so i would go to i would take a train to a different city and i got around really well my italian and i i went to church once in in italy <laughs> which was which was really cool um and uh you know went to see a a, a film which was the film was actually a Japanese film and the subtitles were in Italian. So I'm like listening in Japanese, I'm reading Italian, trying to translate to English. So anyway, stuff like that, where the, the exchange student and then um, going to Italy, those the language opened up those opportunities. So that was great. And I just wanna um, also take the time out because I also had learned about the Sister Cities program as well. Like um, I think, I'm not mistaken, I might be wrong, but I, like I learned about it when I was in Atlanta and I had <laughs> learned because they had like, there's a lot of German industry in Atlanta. Like there's a German American Chamber of Commerce in Atlanta. Okay. There's a lot of German like manufacturing, like steel and stuff like that. And I was just wondering. And then I think Atlanta was like the sister city of like Dusseldorf or some, uh, some city in Germany. So yeah, definitely I would encourage anybody who's interested, find out like the city that you live in. There's usually a sister city program and you can take advantage of something because I'm sure a lot of people didn't even know about that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, I think that's awesome that you got to do that. And um, so you studied abroad in Italy. Did you say you studied abroad in France or you took an intensive French Oh, no, I took an intensive Italian class in graduate school. Um, I have been to France, but I never studied there. And then the, the Italian was, um, I actually, that's actually one of my biggest regrets from undergrad is that I didn't like do a formal study abroad program, but the sister city, I was, I was 30 when I did the sister city trip. So at least I did get to go for that month. And it felt like I kind of made up for um, the opportunity that I didn't take in my undergraduate years. Okay. Okay. Well, that sounds great. I mean, I know, like, I always wanted to take advantage of something like that, like an exchange, but I guess it was no need to because I was a military brat. But um, okay. just in case anybody else is wanting to take advantage of it, and then you said you were 30 when you took advantage, mm -hmm. I think I know that there are different exchange programs that you can do even into your 30s. Um, mm -hmm, I know there mm -hmm. used to be the Robert Bosch Fellowship, and I think you had to be like 32 or 33 or something like that. Um, it goes up to, so just know like it's never too late, you know, for people who are watching. If you think, oh, it's only for like people in college, like, no, right. they have professional <laughs> programs. Like they have programs for professionals where you can go to another, uh, another country and work at a company. So it's not even to just study. You can go there to work. And then the whole thing is you kind of do like a kind of, uh, it's almost like uh, apprenticeship slash internship. And then at the end you present their findings. You It's like you find the business problem and you use that time to get better acquainted with the company and develop a solution 
to that business problem that they have. So um, I think that's good that you did that. And I think that other people, it's good that we're talking about it because I know a lot of people, like I didn't even know about the Robert Bosch Fellowship. I had assumed that, oh, I'm not like 20, so I can't mm-hmm, do it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And I just happened to be going to like, it was like a, a German college fair at the next to the United Nation building in New York. I think. Oh, okay. So they, yeah. they had like uh, the United Nations and then I think they had like the consulate or something like that. And they had like this Robert Bosch thing. And I was like, what is this? And I was like, I know it's not for me, but maybe my sister or somebody. And then they're like, no, you can be 30 something years old. And I was like, wait a second, what? You said how much? <laughs> mm-hmm. right. I'll, I'll, I'll take a pamphlet <laughs> after all. <Yeah. laughs> so I think it's really good that... um you had that experience and I I can see so many people getting motivated by that saying oh okay so it's not just for like 19 year olds like I might be able to do something too I think that's really cool Mm -hmm. um so I have another question and I think I know the answer but I'm not gonna assume (laughs) which one of your foreign languages is your favorite and why um yeah I'll just say it, Italian again because of the, the, <laughs> the sound. yeah it's just it's just so melodic to me okay I, I was gonna I honestly was gonna say French but okay that's fine um now um in in terms of you already used French to teach it did you have any other plans for the other languages like for Italian for Russian um and for um I know you say you were learning French I mean Spanish did you have any plans for using them or basically what was your why like I guess for learning Uh, they were purely for fun like learning for learning's sake um yeah I have no um practical or professional like applications for these it's nice when I um meet people or something I can use a little like I was in Chipotle once and the the employee was he was deaf and so I used a little sign language once or like here and there I'll like use it but nothing like um really formal I just wanted to learn like people some people collect different things um I consider myself a collector of languages I guess at this point so and I just realized I didn't really, I, I feel bad. I kind of let that go to the wayside. So American Sign Language, what brought you, because I didn't get to really ask about that. What brought you to learn, to want to learn about it? Um, that was just, well, I kind of, um, I've been interested in it before, but I uh, I didn't really seize the opportunity until I met the girl in grad school who, well, I should say woman, she, she was the, um, teaching assistant for the professor and she um she had done a lot of work in um, deaf education and she had studied she was not deaf herself but she had studied um ASL for a long time and she was just like you know the Friday thing do you guys want to get does anybody want to get together um and so we we just got a basement or a room a room in the basement of one of the uh, buildings on campus and like we would just meet and uh it was just I don't know, opportunity to just learn another language. Like I can do this for free, you know, among my peers and it's really low key, low pressure. So I, that's why I did that. Um, that's a difficult language too. Um, not just, I mean, grammatically it's actually pretty straightforward, but I, my most challenging thing with that was um remembering like facial expressions like I was so concerned about what to do with my hands obviously because it's sign language but I um like for example who what where when why questions like you have to kind of furrow your brow and like scrunch up your shoulders so like when you're asking like like we say in spoken English what's your name but in sign language is your name what but you have to remember like facial expressions and I was like oh I'm not like so anyway that was difficult oh wow Mm -hmm. and um so the the person who was teaching you was hearing right Mm -hmm. yes and so did did you were you able to 
delve a little bit deeper as far as like, was there anyone included that was like actually deaf or hard of hearing? I'm not sure if it's, I feel bad. I hope I'm not saying the wrong term. I think it's hard of hearing. Mm -hmm. um, was there anyone that was deaf or hard of hearing in your classes or in the group, the get together? Not in this, no, it was a really small group and we were all, we were all hearing um, and it would have been nice to have someone who actually, actually was deaf um, to balance that out. Um. I only asked because um, I don't, I was, I call myself trying to learn and I gave up, but I have a friend who's deaf and he progressively be like, he started off like deaf, hard of hearing like a hearing able deaf person. And then now it's like gotten to the point where he's like not really hearing that well. Mm -hmm. um, but he was, you know, he would often tell me about, you know, he's very, very politically in tune. So he would tell me about like ableism and then like basically mm -hmm. like why it's problematic for hearing people to, it was, it's almost confusing because he would say like certain things like uh, hearing people don't really sign and they expect deaf people to basically perform some of the labor. So they're already disabled, but then they expect them to perform the labor of, uh, what do you call it? Reading, reading and... lips, yeah, reading <laughs> lips or stuff like that. And, you know, he said like they should learn. But then I remember another conversation <laughs> Where he was just like, it's very problematic for hearing able people to sign or to speak for sign to speak for deaf people or to teach sign language. And I was just kind of confused because I was like, well, you said that it was problematic that they didn't do it. And now you said it was, pro I mean, I guess maybe as a hearing person, it, it doesn't make sense exactly immediately to me. So I was just wondering if you had had any conversations like that or if anybody had been a part of it which is fine if I mean it happens I think it's great that people want to learn because I think for so long it was neglected like I even admit admittedly kind of glossed over it didn't really realize it that you did mention that was one of the ones that you picked up so um I guess I'm not really I'm rambling I'm sorry but oh, no, I was no, just no, sorry. <laughs> It is a really important conversation and I um, there are a couple of people I follow on Twitter who are deaf and bring up some of these issues um, It's actually another a writer I follow um, I follow most most of the people I follow on Twitter are writers and one of them happens to be deaf and he wrote about he wrote a modern love piece in the New York Times about like trying to date while deaf and um, so that that as another layer that you know I hadn't thought about because when you're in a position of privilege, whether that's racial or in terms of our conversation right now, like me hearing, like there are a lot of things that I don't think about. Um, but as far as like what your friend said, like I, you know, I, I, I get where your friend is coming from, because like if we think about somebody of a different culture, maybe trying to teach like AAVE, like how would we feel about that? Um, because they're right, coming right. from, you know, outside positions, like maybe, you know, they have good intentions and um, I don't, I'm not a person who like, you know, I, I think a lot of people are well-meaning, but these are things that, you know, we can take a step back and like really hear where marginalized groups are coming from, um, whatever the demographics. So, yeah. That's a good point. I didn't even think about it like that because I think I've posted in the group and then sidebar, let me just say, if you're black and you're a woman, mutually inclusive events you must be black and a woman <laughs> at the same time you can join the group the facebook group because it's a safe space for black women um it's, it's three entry questions you have to so you can join the group and join in on the conversations not only language i mean obviously that's why we're together in the group but i occasionally post things that are not uh, necessarily related to language or travel or culture and other people do. It's just a safe space for Black women to just muse about being a Black woman, the end, and, or or language or travel. Anyway, I just wanted to like put that in there. But um, yeah, I know I posted in the group too. Like I posted in the group uh, like the most recent thing about the disabled woman and her husband and she's been trying to get him to help her do the laundry for 10 years. <laughs> and it's like, dude, like, 
um, you know, just stuff like that. And then, mm -hmm. and I know I also posted about, I'm just saying, just thinking about that from the ableist perspective, but then also as far as what you mentioned, the um, AAVE, uh, you know, I'm like a firecracker as soon as I hear that. Black vernacular or AAVE, I'm like a firecracker that say, I don't want to hear nothing anybody has to say. And, you know, I get really touchy, especially when it's like, you know, people that's not um, descendant of slaves, they want to, you know, a uh, girl this or, you know, oh, you crazy, crazy, you know, like, no, it's absolutely not. So I get it. Like when you mentioned that, it's like kind of click for me, like, OK, I understand where my friend is coming from now. Um, and I hope that also enlightens the people that are watching, because, you know, um, sometimes it's nice to, you know, educate people and although I'm not really educating right now you are <laughs> <laughs> that is a joint effort we're bouncing off each other I guess so I hope so um and so um now I'm thinking I'm like I wanted to ask you something else um hopefully I'll get back to it but another question I wanted to ask because this is something that a lot of people struggle with I didn't really struggle with it so much with French and Spanish and German. Um, I find myself struggling a little bit with Arabic um, speaking. A lot of people get apprehensive to speak, right? Because they don't want to sound stupid. They don't want to make a mistake. But the bottom line is you're learning. You're going to make a mistake. Yeah, you are going to sound stupid at some point. You just got to get over it. So I was just wondering, did you also have that in either of your languages like that? Uh, I don't really want to say anything. And how did you overcome that? Uh, yeah, I certainly um, exhibited those fears. Like, I think, I mean, yeah, like you said, like, you, it's universal to have like trepidation about speaking. And but then add to that, that I was pretty shy and reserved probably until I was like in college. That's when I first came on my show. So that was another layer <laughs> and um, <laughs> also self-conscious. So um, yeah, it was really hard for me. I think it wasn't until um, maybe the last few years that I've um, started to overcome that by reminding myself that um, people are probably not judging me as harshly as I'm judging myself. Mm -hmm. And I also tried to put myself in the shoes of somebody learning English. And when I hear them speak, I'm not judging them for their accent or when they make mistakes or if they can't remember the word, like I'm just, you know, patiently listening. And I think, um, I mean, some people are, are jerks and judgy, but for the most part, I think most people are just like, oh, you're trying, you know, so just uh, don't assume the worst about what people are, are thinking. Cause I, I think, um, I don't think it's as bad most of the time as we as we imagine so this is true um I recently well not really recently but fairly recently within the past year I read that book the four agreements and mm -hmm. one of the agreements is to not make assumptions because a lot of times it's it's it, it it's these voices that don't even come from us it's just things we've heard over time and they just manifest into our voice where it's not really our voice. And so we make these assumptions like, and, and it's like, it's best to not until, until a person, and if a person does say you suck at that language, then that's just their issue. It's not yours. Okay. That, right. that leads that, that mm -hmm. leads to the, um, the, the fourth agree, the second agreement. So the third agreement, I have it on my vision board. That's what I'm looking at. But nice. the, the, the third agreement is do not make assumptions. And then if they do say something negative, you go to the second agreement, do not take anything personally. Mm -hmm. So I think it also, I'm actually, you know, I'm, I meant to write, yeah, I wanted to write, do a video on the four agreements of language learning because it also, for language learning, like don't take yeah. it personal because I have had the same, um, I wasn't shy to speak, um, I was actually shy to speak Spanish, but not for the reason you may think. Like most of the time people, are shy because they're like, oh, I don't want to sound stupid. But my thing was, um, I grew up, um, I think, I want to say for a year or two with Spanish in the household when I was like, I think three or four, or something like that. I wasn't school age yet. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, we grew up with Spanish in the household. I wasn't speaking it though, but I was hearing it day in and day out. So 
when I speak Spanish, I get a lot of people saying, you know, like that I sound like a native. And so I would say stuff and people would be like, oh, you know, like where are you from, where your family's from? And I'm like, I'm from New York, you know, I'm just regular Douglas, my little black girl from Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. Then it was like, oh, you're a wannabe, you're a wannabe. Oh, and I was mm -hmm. just like, okay. So after a while I started to like purposely say things with like an American accent. Oh, mm -hmm. because, mm -hmm. Like, so for instance, I would say, I'm trying to think of something. You know, like you would say, um, hablo un poquito de español. And mm -hmm. I would say, like, hablo un poquito de español. Like, mm -hmm. I would purposely yeah, do that yeah. because I, I got tired of people telling me I was a wannabe because I spoke it so well. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I guess everybody has their reasons, but just don't make any assumptions. I think that's mm -hmm. a good, that was a very good point. Don't make any assumptions. Sometimes it's not even as bad as we think. Like, um, whenever I would try to speak, I don't know, have you, have you had this experience that you try to speak with a native speaker and they keep trying to switch to English? Have you had that? Oh, yeah. yeah, so that didn't happen in France much because I do sound really close to a native speaker. So they were like, oh, she's, she knows what's up. But in, uh, in Italy, for sure, like they kept switching. I was like, no, I'm like, I'm trying to <laughs> <laughs> but I practicare, like, um, you know, dimmi in Italian. So, yeah, in, a, like, the hotel, especially, because, of course, like, tourists, like, clearly. Um, but I was, like, no, I, I would, like, try to steer it back. And um, usually I was successful. In this one restaurant, though, this guy, like, really insisted on just, like, sticking to English. So I was, like, okay, whatever. <laughs> so. And how do you feel? How does it make you feel when they do that? Um... I was, I was both frustrated and um, not insulted, but it was just like, I felt hurt. Mm, I, I guess cause slightly hurt because it's like, oh, he thinks I can't handle this or like, I can't, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not good enough to like, he doesn't, he's underestimating me. So it was like, yeah, I didn't, I didn't like it, but at the same time, I also knew that again I'm always bringing up that I think most people in the world mean well and like they're trying to make it easier for me at this in this linguistic transaction um so he's trying to he's trying to be accommodating but I'm I'm looking at so I had to kind of change how I was perceiving it too but my initial thing was just to like kind of bristle like, hey, I, <laughs> let me try you know let me try uh but then I'm like oh no he's trying to help me out so yeah well, I have two interesting perspectives for you and anybody else who have experienced this because I experienced it too. Um, it was funny, I went to France. Uh, I've been to France twice. The first time I went to France, um, I didn't have that problem with anyone switching to English with me. Um, I guess my French was that good. I don't, I don't know, but it's not anymore. <laughs> um, so I didn't have that problem. Um, I know when I started learning German, it, and I also have that issue. I don't have that issue with Spanish. Like I'll tell them I only speak a little bit of Spanish, but they don't believe it. Like they just keep <laughs> speaking. And I'm like, no, please. No. But with German, I have had that. And it's two interesting perspectives I want to offer you and anyone else who's been frustrated by them that tried to keep switching to English. The first perspective is they may not be a native speaker themselves. Mm -hmm. I had this issue. Uh, there was a coworker I had. I would always call him. He would always speak English with me, and I would always try to speak German with him, and he would not. And I got really frustrated. And I was like, you know, finally, I just did everything in English: emails, phone calls, everything. And then I finally moved here um, to the, you know, I live in Germany now, and I met him in person, you know, because the headquarters for my company is here. Um, I met him in person only to realize he's Dutch. That's why he keeps trying to do it. It had nothing to do with that my German wasn't good enough. He can't even really speak German. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. that's, you know, so I kind of felt bad because I took it personally. Like, what? My German is good enough. And it wasn't even that. <laughs> right. And then a second perspective that I also want to offer everybody else is I had another coworker. Uh, IT person came and they needed to switch the computer next to me out for my intern 
and um he was just like they always look at me because you know I, I don't look German so every time they like German or English and I'm like whichever one is better for you right mm -hmm. and they like oh you know he's insisting on speaking English and I'm like we can speak German it's fine this is very simple like it's not rocket science or anything mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But he kept insisting and I was like I know my German is not bad like I know it's not why does he keep switching and it was really driving me crazy and it makes me feel you know like you said frustrating like hey I can do this you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Only to find out at the end, you know, I just finally was just like, fine, he wants to speak English, whatever. So in the end, he ends up telling me like, you know, uh, thank you so much. I really just wanted to practice my English. You know, my uncle is coming from the US and so he doesn't speak German. And I think he's, his other language is Arabic and his uncle doesn't speak Arabic either. Oh, and so yeah. he was like thank you for letting me speak to practice English and then I felt like such a jerk because I was like oh my god I ruined this opportunity <laughs> to practice I was like I got you know I assume yeah so I just wanted to offer you that as well as anybody else the gift of one they may not be native either or two they just want to practice their English they this is the one opportunity in 20 years they got and they yeah, just to practice. Right. So I just wanted to offer that. No, thank you. That's an additional perspective to keep in mind. I, yeah, I, I did meet somebody who wanted to practice English like intentionally, and that's why they were switching. But um, it's funny though, when I did, when somebody did, when I did keep speaking Italian and then they realized, okay, we can keep, usually they would say, oh, you know, your time's pretty good. So that was like, vindicating I guess but yeah yeah I mean mm -hmm. and that's the thing you need all those little wins and the validation any validation you can get along the way you need it to keep you going because mm -hmm. it's so easy to get discouraged and then that also leads me to um I need I, I have like three more questions I want to ask the first question I want to ask is ha, um we all hit that point where we're just like forget this I I, I can't um what keeps you going when you get to that point like what is it that makes you say all right uh, all right like I took a break and I'm not gonna give it up hmm. um I guess just knowing that if I if I quit now then I will never get you know I will never not only reach fluency but also like on a like I try to keep like fun goals in mind. Like I, so I really like dumplings. So I'm like, okay, I want to order some, I want to be able to order some Russian <laughs> dumplings one day. Or like I watch, I watch a lot of movies. So I'm like, okay, I want to be able to watch this um, movie without subtitles. Or like, so not just like, yeah, the textbook definition of, of fluency, but also I try, I don't know, I, I try to keep those little goalposts in mind. Um, and yeah, so that's, I guess that's one thing that keeps me going. Um, and that it, and I remind myself of like how good it feels to, you know, reach another milestone or another level. Like when I got to B2 in Italian, I was like really excited and um, stuff like that. Or like one, another thing that's like not tangible is like dreaming. Whenever I have a dream in another language that I wake up like on fire. Cause I'm like, that is like, that really means like it's merging like within me. I don't know. So yeah, that keeps me going. Okay. Yeah, I, I know. I think I think that's like one of the things that every language learner, like when they dream in that other language, it's like, yes. Mm -hmm. Like master level unlocked is what mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. feels like. So yeah. Okay. Um then my next to last question is um what three tips can you offer anyone who's trying to learn another language? You don't have to give three. If you only have one, that's fine. But I usually just say three because it's a nice magical number. Um, let's see. One is I would say to um, try to make language part of your daily routine and so far as possible, maybe not daily, but just frequently because um, I know we're all busy. We have a million things. So you might not be able to um, again crack open a huge a huge like grammar book or something but 
you know, while you're driving, maybe listen to a podcast in your target language or listen, you know, put some music on um, or while you're cooking, you know, you can be playing something in the background just so that it's, it's getting into your subconscious, even if you're too busy to do like more formal stuff. Um, another tip is just to find what what works for you you know some people love duolingo like i didn't i didn't really have success with that app um but i i prefer you know other methods like some people like rosetta stone some people again listen to like podcasts or they like the books or they get a conversation partner so just i guess find what works best for you and then try to you know just try to make time to for it and then the third thing i'll say is kind of going back to what I was saying before, just make, try to make it fun. Like if you have, again, those, those more amusing goals, like I said about the dumplings or like, if you want to learn, like I have this book, <laughs> Dirty Italian, this is like a book of swear words. In oh, Italian, wow. it's, so, <laughs> yeah. it's like, there's so many in here. Oh, I haven't, I haven't even opened this in years, but um, I bought this because I just needed a break from just like, normal Italian stuff I was like I just want to so I just ordered it on uh, eBay or something just like oh this is a fun way for me to still learn part, some of the language but like just yeah so just try to think of fun stuff okay that's a good <laughs> one I think you know I ran across this website called is it dirty Spanish or something? But it was it was something Spanish, but it was basically all like sexual stuff, <laughs> like uh -huh. stuff you say during sex. I was like, what in the world? Like I don't even know the word. Like I just was just like, this is not. And the thing was, I was looking like I just I think I, I googled how to flirt in Spanish. Oh, okay. And then yeah. it just came up with this. One. I'm like, oh, thinking like it's like flirty stuff, like you look good, and you you know, oh, it was stuff like you know. Yeah, right, real dirty. And I was just like, not ready. I wasn't ready. I can't do the Kevin Hart. He's like, oh no, I'm not ready. <laughs> like I can't do it. But that's how I felt, and I was like, oh no. But yeah, I I, I mean. The curse words, though, I think that's much better. <laughs> oh, there's there's also the um, sexual stuff in here too, but I, yeah, but yeah, mostly okay. curse words. <laughs> I think that's the first thing everybody like. Well, I won't say everybody. Majority of people want to learn. First thing they were like, oh, how do you call someone a bee? <laughs> how, do you call someone, how do you say f you? <laughs> like I think that's like the first thing everybody learns when they, they want to learn, should I say, when they learn the language. <laughs> All right. And then my final question is, if anybody wanted to get in touch with you and learn more, how can we keep up with you on social? Uh, so I have a website, which is first name, last name .com. So it's daniellehayden.com, D-A-N-I-E-L-L-E-H-A-Y-D-E-N.com. And then um, that links to... I'm not very active on IG, but that links to my IG, my Twitter, um, all of those things. So that's probably the best place to go. All right. Well, I want to take, I, I had fun. Uh, this was great. <laughs> I hope that everything you said, I hope, I know that it resonated with some people and I know that it probably inspired some people as well, especially with the um, Sister City Exchange program that you did. So, um, and then also really quick, I know I said that was my last question. Another thing I want to go back to, your mm -hmm. French here, you got that opportunity to speak French, but you were not certified in French, right? No, well, so I did an alternate alternative um, certification program. This was actually with Teach for America, so. Mm -hmm. um, because so. I know someone that said that they had applied for some positions teaching foreign language and they mm -hmm. don't have like actual certification or anything like that, but. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they were able to have like a little, like they had like this little conversation session and then they were able to get job offers to teach the foreign languages. And so I just wanted to touch upon that because I know there's a lot of people like, oh, I don't have C2 and I don't have this mm -hmm. and um, that it is possible to get teaching jobs in foreign language without that, as long as you can actually you know the language, but mm -hmm. you don't mm -hmm. have to have that. Definitely. And then, and, and um, yeah, just keep, 
keep looking for job posts because there there are also opportunities like I know the um I know the library offers like uh, or at least pre-pandemic offer like language classes or there are other programs that are that you don't have to be certified that are you know not through traditional K through 12 systems so community colleges like um yeah all righty. Well, thank you so much. I'm so glad you came. Like I said, I think that it resonated with several people, I'm sure. And thank I'm sure you. that inspired them and gave them some information to hit the ground ready. So um, yeah, and then again, if you want to be a part of the group, you must be a Black woman. These two things must occur at the same time. www.facebook.com slash groups slash Black Girls Learning Languages. If you want to support and you're not a Black woman, but you like, you know, you want to support, you still want to engage, there's a public fan page. You can go to www.facebook.com slash Black Girls Learning Languages and it will take you to the public fan page. Everything else will be in the description box. So if you want to get in touch with Danielle or if you want to get, in, you know, connected through social media, my other platforms, it'll be all in the description box below. And then that's pretty much it. So I will see you next time. Besitos. Bye. Au revoir. Ciao. <laughs>